Welcome to the February 20th, 2024 Jail and Zones production user call. We have Dan, Jan, Doug, and myself, Michael, so far. And Doug, I'd love to know if there is any OCI news. Some small updates. Um, we have GitHub repository, which was in the, in the last report. We've um, added some use cases to that. I would love to get, to get pull requests for other people's things that they would like to do with OCI use cases. Um, there's in the GitHub repository, there's a docs subdirectory with a requirements.md. Just read it, add stuff, send a pull request. That'd be great. Um, the idea is that we're trying to, to figure out which problems we want to solve. And so I need people to tell me their problems. Um, apart from that, very small news. I created a dedicated Slack channel on the OCI Slack. This is open to pretty much everyone. Um, you have to, I don't think there are many hoops that you have to jump through to get in, to, to get registered on the OCI Slack. I did this like 18 months ago. I can't remember how it worked, but it should be, go to the, go to the um, open containers uh, website and there should be some instructions somewhere on on how to find the Slack and how to get registered. Excellent. There is already a FreeBSD channel, a general purpose FreeBSD channel on the OCI Slack, um, but I added one for the working group just to keep that focused on specific areas for FreeBSD implementation on OCI. That's about it. I mean, personally, I've been working on um, upgrading things to cope with the somewhat major changes that Podman is doing in their version 5.0. Uh, they're deprecating some old tech and a few FreeBSD things, got min minor breakage along the way. Um, what else? There's some news from, well, I'm not sure whether this is public news, but there's some indications that the FreeBSD Foundation are interested in funding a project to fix union FS and make it useful. That would be fantastic. That is fascinating because that's definitely come up over the years. Um, I mean, union FS is, is a nice idea. And then you read the man page and it's got this giant list of bugs at the end. You think yep. I'm not touching that. Yep. Correct. So, I mean, having, being able to remove that section of the man page would be fantastic. And I think it would probably work quite well as an efficient container layer stacking system. So is Although this ZFS correct? works really well for that. Indeed, indeed. So I, I can <clears> see how it was a um, you know, workaround back in the day. Welcome, Ararat. Mm. And, it, and Doug, Union is that the FS, correct link I've put there? Sorry to interrupt. So Union FS, if fully implemented, would be more than just a workaround for lacking a copy on write file system mm. because it, if fully implemented, which includes materializing write out files in the upper stack layers, it would allow um, having basically the layers decoupled similar to what I've been doing with uh, read only clones, but at a per file instead of a per mount point level. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is that it requires changes to the ZFS uh, on disk format because ZFS doesn't have a file type for whiteouts. As far as I know, yeah. only UFS supports that. Um, so that's, that's an issue. I think the I, next I issue have... is that to uh, encounter all the hours hidden in the virtual file system layer because you're breaking so many assumptions the code makes in. So I think that uh, Linux Overlay FS does this differently. I, it has something analogous to whiteouts, but it does them differently. And I can't remember exactly how. They might be named in a, in a code, like files named in a special way. Or maybe there's, there's a, with it Overlay gets... FS, there are three file systems, the lower layer, upper layer, and a work dire. And maybe it just stores all this extra meta stuff in the work diet. I don't really know, but it's, it's definitely possible to do this without having to have special whiteout support. 
in the, in if the layer. If you files. need a wide out to be a special path pattern, I think you will run into issues with the name caching because uh, yeah, then you, I, you can't do a lookup for path components uh, or subpaths in the name cache because then you will maybe you have to split the path in places you otherwise wouldn't yeah. have to because otherwise you are not getting the ability to match against the whiteouts. Yeah, I need, to, how, I need to do a bit of research. Uh, I, need to, I need to do a bit of research and see how OverlayFS actually Hello. works. Welcome, Antrenig. Welcome, uh, Ararat and Rod. A lot lower hanging fruit, which would also be very useful for instantiating read only file systems multiple times as uh, jails, would be to bring back UMAP FS. So that you can have a fit, kind of a null FS mount point with a different view on uh, UIDs and GIDs. So that, yeah. for example, you have unique uh, user and group ID ranges for jails so that they don't alias the host and can be targeted, for example, with hierarchical um, resource limits. If you have several user IDs in a jail right now, you can't disambiguate them without yeah change owning and change grouping files which isn't possible with a big read only file system yeah i mean linux does this right with their union namespace uh, na sorry uid namespaces um in my opinion they, let him finish um apart from allowing you to to clearly define the mapping between the containers view of UIDs and, and the host view, it um, allows substantial amounts of container-based workloads to be run without root privs, which is great. But I'm not going to implement that. That's a big project, and I have other things that I want to do first. So an academic question, so could or should ZFS have better whiteout support or some notion of whiteout support or something in place of it? Uh, you may be able to do it with, uh, with extended attributes to have an extended attribute that if an empty file is really a whiteout or something. Hmm. Maybe, yeah. In uh, your system, uh, extended attribute range or something. So. It's just that then this convention has to be um, universally accepted or something. And what mm -hmm. I mean, criticize with Linux's designs is that they remap the user ID. So a jail can, uh, or sorry, a Linux container namespace can have the UID namespace and then have its user ID zero be something else instead of just having the file system translate the UID and GID in the, on the way in and out. So I wouldn't want to go that far as creating all the confusion with changing the user IDs at the system call boundary, but instead just have a null FS mount point with a different view on the user and group IDs in the file system. So the jail would still see that it hasn't, it doesn't have unique user. The, uh, IDs and the host can still look in and see the same user ID and group ID. It's just that the file system, when yeah. you start it, presents a different user ID by just adding an offset uh, or something. Well, one thing that it does allow um, with this, this explicit remapping is the possibility of a container's root UID not being privileged on the host. Yeah, that's another problem we have with unprivileged jails that none of the RC.D scripts work because uh, if you disable a super user in a jail, things like SU uh, won't work and because all of the uh, RC.D scripts go through, it, uh, it just explodes. Yeah, I don't know what the semantics are on Linux for that. Maybe I think it allows uh, UID transitions within the defined UID mapping set. But you know, I I'm more 
more of a free BSD guy. I don't really know the details on Linux stuff. I just know that this feature yeah. is really heavily used by a lot of people in the container community. But even an unprivileged uh, single UID uh, jail doesn't work with rc.d scripts right now. Sure. Because the rc.d uh, subroutines just call too many uh, pools which refuse to continue if they uh, can't do their job. Because they yeah. don't check that they're jailed and are supposed to be unprivileged. Especially thing when which... you run them as an unprivileged UID zero. Yeah. Um, another thing which Linux allows for, which might make certain um, jail workloads better, is the PID namespace. So allowing the container to have its own PID one. And then that means that you can actually run a, 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 in, a real init inside the jail and, and have it do the right thing. Personally, I don't mm -hmm. care about that for most of my workloads, but some people do. And it, but again, so, it yeah. has the downside of of the container PIDs being having having a mapping going on, so it's difficult to reason. Wouldn't it? You enter the container, you look at the PID, and you're trying to remember work out what the host PID corresponding is. It's, it's harder. Anyway. How, how about instead of doing that, just uh, the full translation, just adding a feature to register a existing PID to stand in for PID1 in a jail? Could be. I mean, we have similar stuff. I mean, not really quite the same thing, but um, you can nominate a, a process as being a, the default reaper so that it acts like... Um, in it for all of its sub processes, the tree of, of, of children processes. Um, mm -hmm. That's used with containers so that the SIG childs and the and the and the uh, all get managed for the container by the by the engine. The Podman Conmon deals with this. Um, what's it called? The Doug? sub reaper. That's right. Oh, okay. Yes, if then I'm not, proxy TL. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, the project I've got on screen intended to do that. It would be PID virtualization created by Bjorn Zeeb. So I, there was a diff that I saw a few months back by Bjorn. Um, right, that's that probably implemented this, this. I wasn't sure from reading the diff whether... Um, whether the the jail PID namespace has a mapping in the in the host or not, hmm. because that's that's an potentially important part of the OCI spec is that the the paradigm involves knowing what the host container the host PID of the container's main process is, so that we can wait wait for that, and that's the the. Um, container life cycle is governed by that PID. So typically, you know, inside the container PID one is mapped to some host PID. And that's the that's the one which OCI uses to observe the runtime of the of the container. So yeah, what well, if we do something in this area, I think it needs to have some sort of mapping that allows for something running on the host to interact with Processes running inside the PID namespaced container, jail, whatever. Really, I think it's important from for a random sysadmin to be able to look at something and say, "Hey, that process is doing something weird. It's using up sixteen times the CPU that it should. I'm just going to kill it." Having to enter the jail presents problems to hmm. for debugging okay. that kind of thing. You might not trust the jail. Good point. Yeah, and the, for example, you can run into problems with pit names facing like someone looking out from the inside and reading a pit file. What you need a PID which isn't the right one, and by design you have to go through a translation syscall to do the translation, which is inherently racy. Mm. I mean, so, it's it's a 
it's a complicated beast underneath. I, I, again, this is a big project which I have no time for. But do we really need the full PID translation, or do we just have to remap the jail's view of what PID one is, so that uh, tools which send signals to PID one work, also known as system uh, system D uh, problem? Mm. Because if I'm that's really all I'm we need, sorry. it could be a lot easier to just say this process is now this it's jail's PID one. Basically, when from inside the jail, you send a signal to PID one, you uh, send a signal to this process. Sounds a bit hacky, but they both both options are a bit hacky. So I'm not sure which okay. is, which is better. Or, or <laughs> no, um, so yeah, uh, as far as I can tell, containers without us that uh, like sharing the host PID uh, PID namespace works. Well enough for my purposes, but I think I like the idea of having a, a PID virtualization thing in some form. What uh, use case other than what basically privileged PIDs or meaningful PIDs other than PID one are there? So what I'm not sure about that. But one thing, PID virtualization it's a, it's a, or remapping instead of just there is, partitioning there is, the there is one PIDs. thing. There is one thing which I don't know whether it's a, an important thing, but it, it removes a potential communication channel from the jail to the out to the host, or from the jail to some other jail, but, because by you can't the jail can't like there's a you can you could imagine a low bandwidth messaging protocol that that created PIDs and 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 allowed so. On one side, somebody would try to would try to create a process, look at its PID, and then know that derive information about what other other jails oh, on the same host. Yeah, there's doing. a randomizer, so, but yeah, there's probably yeah. a very little bit of bandwidth left, even if you add uh, the yeah. enable the PID yeah. randomizer. It seems seems kind of theoretical, but people do weird stuff with with bugs like this. So that's one issue, one area that PID virtualization would help with, I suppose. In that case, maybe we should take the uppermost bits of the PID and put the jail ID in there. Maybe. Hmm. But yeah, it gets a bit tight in 32 bits. So if we extend the PID map space to 64 bits, that would be the clean solution just put the jail ID and process ID to form one, and then you have a partition namespace inside a yeah. big enough integer. Um, Which would... How would, would that work? I mean, the... the is there a the system upper limit on the, on the maximum PID? I can't remember. It used to be 65535, but it's bigger now. But I don't think it's full 32 bit. Yeah, you would have to maybe to do it properly. You would have to change the data structure there. Yeah, it might be there might be scalability problems there. But... Did that come up a few months ago? There was something about putting the JID somewhere. I'm spacing what it was. Antrenig or Jan, you might remember. We we thought that would be so useful to just have it but what was it there there was a th that was it the p the, the the diff that you're showing that's the one that we went over it we and did so that for the virtualization but there was somewhere we thought it would be so handy to have just the pid included in not i have configure mount or something ridiculous with the gid somewhere that was super useful i'll um, try to find that i think it was uh, when renaming interfaces and moving them Got it. Anyway, anything else on uh, PID virtualization to borrow the term used in the review? Nothing on PID virtualizations. I do have a question for yes, the group please. about um, NetMap. So there's so relatively recently, we've imported the this netmap 
subsystem from Linux, which allows you to use sockets to um, manipulate ne uh, the network stack and create functional interfaces, that kind of thing. Um, this, this, this is used um, on the Linux side for creating the networking state for containers amongst other things. Um, my question um, is, um, finish. how can I get a host socket that can manipulate the VNet of a jail, a VNet jail? Supposing I've got a jail, it was created with its own network stack. How do I get a host file descriptor on, on the host that I can use to manipulate the netmap state of the jail VNet? So uh, I think you're asking about NetLink, not MapMap. Map. So NetLink, NetLink yeah. and NetMap Net are two different. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. I'm having a senior moment. But yeah, NetLink. Um, so um, in Linux, I think in some cases you're you're allowed to basically specify the network namespace, so that the host yeah, so the, the creates tools, its the socket tools, and then it basically yeah. says create this interface in this uh, namespace. I don't know if FreeBSD it, does it like this, like that. If not, you would have to create a child process, create the socket there, and then send it all back through a Unix socket. Yeah, I thought I thought of that. I mean, Linux. If you look, if you read this, the source code to container networking pl um, plugins and things like that, you can see it. It, it temporarily enters the container namespace. Does whatever it needs to, and then exits. Jails are a one-way thing, so um, you'd have to do it in a child process. That was the only solution I kind of had to was sending the file descriptor out again. I've not tried this. I'm not certain that it would actually work, but it should work. If the if the file descriptor that gets transferred still has the states telling it which VNet to examine, rather than it maybe. I had this idea that if it if it was trans trans it transitioned to a a host file descriptor, then maybe it would start looking at the host VNet again. But I don't know. I haven't tried it. I need to write a test program. Um, for for normal sockets, you when you move them between jails, um, they stay in their network namespace, and you can use this, for example, to attach a, a TCP connection from your host SSHD to a VNet enabled jail via PUM uh, so that it jail attaches itself to a jail and then you are, have an SSH session into a jail with no network stack because the file descriptor capability doesn't need to go through uh, the existing network stack. But it could be that NetLink sockets are special because they manage your network stack. But mm. I think they should just keep a reference to their VNet slash prison. Well, I hope so. Um, uh, yeah. So if you have the right to enter the thing through the child process, you should be able to do it through, by basically using socket pair with a Unix socket. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, to get your both sets of a connected uh, Unix socket without having to go through uh, the file system at all to bind it somewhere. And then you can yeah. use that socket to send the file descriptor back. Unless the other you want option to get would... even hackier and use ptrace yeah. or something to steal oh, the yeah. file descriptor. No, no. Um, there is an, an option which I don't like, would, which would be you fork a child enter the jail and then use that to proxy but that i keep so keep the child running and, and yeah. use it to proxy but i don't like that you, you um, could, could use a sequential option. packet socket like that yeah um but uh, you should be able to get the file descriptor out yeah i think i think that's the best solution um it would be better if there was a way of getting this information without diving into the jail because that again, if you're not trusting the jail environment, that's mm. that's a vulnerability. Like if I'm supposing I want no, to get network how stats, is it a vulnerability? I'd have to actually enter the. But you know, I can. A vulnerability, maybe not, 
but it, uh, there's a window uh, that allows uh, an untrusted jail to attack this child process that briefly enters and sends a, um, a child to school trial. Yeah. I mean, it seems it seems implausible that that's a real problem, but you know, if there was a way yeah. of me creating like a, like an in the sock adder or something in in uh, netlink saying the uh giving the jail id then i could get my my um netlink socket without bothering yeah. to enter the jail but that would be cleaner api as well the next problem would be that how do you reliably identify the namespace or in this our case jail um do you do it by name? Do you do it by jail ID? Those are the only two realistic options, but both can be reused potentially. So you have a, a similar problem to uh, first ID think... uh, races. I don't the think the jail is basically destroyed and recreated. Yeah, I've been creating a lot of jails over the last year or two, and I see the the jail IDs. Monotonically increasing. Uh, only but I haven't got until you close hit a to million. The point. I, yeah. Um, so jail IDs, I don't tend to use them in my encode. I use the the full um, jail name, mostly because it's convenient in the 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 way the code worked out. But um, I would use. I would tend to, you know, treat them identically. The the jail name or the or the um, jail ID would be the way you specify. Yeah. As yeah. Rod just mentioned, uh, two recently looked at the code and the kernel will only pick uh, jail IDs up to 1 million minus one and then start reusing them. If all of these right. traits in theory exist, the kernel can't auto-generate jail IDs anymore, but you're free to use any non-negative no, any positive uh, 32 bit integer. So, sign 32 bit integer. Uh, so, you can basically start at a million if you want to have static jail IDs which don't conflict with auto allocation. Right. Which may be important if you have to have uh, quick and easy and mapping between jail ID, DevFS, uh, root set number, and so on. On, on that note, jail IDs are unique across the whole host. If you have a jail which starts jails, the ID is assigned on the host, not within the jail, if you know what I mean. Correct. For example, I run package, uh, Pudrier in a jail, and I can do JLS on the jail and see all the Pudrier jails that are in another yeah. jail. And the fresh ports nodes, they run jails within their jails too. And I can see them on the host as well. And I don't I don't I don't find seeing the host, I don't find seeing the jail jails on the host to be inconsistent because it is the host. So it should see everything and they're they're not yeah. DMs. I think the, the main thing you want to avoid is for one jail to be able to see another jail's children. Yes. Agree. But uh, uh, on a Pudir builder with a bit of uptime, you can easily see jail IDs into the tens of thousands. I haven't had yet one overflow of uh, 1 million jail IDs yet between reboots, but uh, if, yeah, with a big enough system and enough uptime, it will happen. So Rod has kindly chimed in with the size of the the PID and the max jail. Um, it's would it be pretty disruptive to have a JID and a PID? Would it be, how would it be separated? How would it be unique? And would it break all the things? I think it would be, it would look, I don't know, it depends how you do it. I mean, you could you could have a host PID that has some high bits that, that, that reference the jail in some way. And then inside the jail, if if that could be masked out, because otherwise anybody inside the jail would just have these gigantic numbers for the PIDs, and it would be kind of surprising. Is that kind of how yeah. Linux handles uh, multi-threading? 
by having basically the real PID be the first, the upper bits, and then the thread inside the process be the lower bits or something? Yeah, I think that's a bit. <laughs> There's, uh, I, I did not look and find out where jail underbar max is applied. So that there may be an assumption there that you can only have that many jails or that the jail number is always an integer lower than that. That could actually just be an upper bound on the number of structs allowed. Isn't, you can have j a jail IDs above that if you manually allocate them a jail creation. So if you configure the jail ID in jail.conf, you can have a one over okay. one million. I'm using. So, that so right where now. is jail max applied at? It's uh, the it's applied at when the kernel picks a jail ID, because you haven't given it it one to, to create a new jail. Okay, so, so why is there the upper limit? Why does that have an artificial allocator. limit? I think the, there That's is no question. limit other than that it has to fit in thirty two bits and that it's a signed integer. Again, why is why did why does jail max exist? Well, That's a really good question. <laughs> the only reason I can I mean realize I, I was looking at a five dot four system when I pulled this out. So these things have been around for a long time. The only places where but I they, find I did it being confirm they, they both hold on one seen. at a time. One at a time. Go ahead, Rod. I did confirm that these are both still valid. In other words, jail max is there in sys, sys jail dot h on current. Yeah, there's not probably a... a reason. Maybe the reason's not there anymore. Um, Paul Henning might remember, I suppose. I think it has to do with the fact that you allocate a jail, the, the jail structure was allocated possibly in a fixed array, and you wanted an upper bound on that malloc. I don't know no more case anymore. Yeah, it's dynamically it allocated and deallocated. And the other thing is uh, that some of the jail tools assume that a jail ID fits uh, in six uh, digits when it comes to formatting output. So the columns may be no longer aligned when you uh, have longer jail IDs in JLS. But that's nothing what, that doesn't happen with fast SSDs uh, and um, IO starter. <laughs> I'll try to ask him. Anyhow, uh, have we exhausted that topic? Let's see. Completely changing gears. Ararat, do you have any questions in production with Antrenig? We do, but it's zones oriented. Ah, okay. Well, yes. uh, you will be perhaps the uh, consumer's end producers of that topic but if it's quick go ahead and enlighten sure. us. sure so uh, one thing we had a problem today uh networking oriented is that we forgot that our half a million dollar dna sequencer at the sixth floor was shut down and someone decided to turn it on and use it because you know scientists and uh when it booted apparently we set on it the same IP as our DHCP server. And the DHCP server was running inside a, a Illumos zone. Now, obviously everything went wrong. None of the scientists were able to connect to the Wi-Fi do, and even Raspberry Pis, monitoring systems, a lot of the things got, got bad. So one thing that we did like is if you run IP Adam, which is uh, an abstraction on top of if config, uh, it will tell you that it the IP has been duplicated. And I think I have it in the chat here, exactly what it looks like. Uh, where is that? Where is that? There we go. Okay. And paste. Okay. So, which is a good thing, I guess. And FreeBSD does kind of the same, not in if config, but rather it does it in dmessage. Yeah, it might just flood your dmessage, message, message. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it prints a, it oh, prints a message cool. saying that... that uh, it prints a message saying that, you know, someone else is using this IP. In this case, it knows it's duplicated and it also stops using that IP. 
So, you know, other problems would not happen, you know, like, uh, I don't know, in this case, um, uh, maybe the DNA sequencer is not able to connect to its cloud or whatever it is. So, like, I think this is a good, uh, good uh, default. Let's hmm. put it that way. To um, show that? Sorry? A good default to show that? Or what, what, what do you envision perhaps changing to accommodate? Um, in, 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 in FreeBSD's case, and I don't think it would be that hard to implement, maybe, uh, is to maybe have it, you know, like the options and flags in um, in uh, in if config. Maybe we can show it somewhere. Yeah, the, like it, it sounds like to me that your DNS sequencer may be breaking the rules a little bit. And that on first IP assignment, it should do an ARP request to find out if anybody is using that IP. True. Already. Absolutely agree. Yes, because I've had if, a similar situation before in my life on in that same infrastructure with a modern Linux system booting, and it did not start doing problems. It checked. It was like, uh oh, someone else is using. So it didn't use it. And it, 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 it should never use it. it exactly. It, it refused to come online. So first yes. off, there's a bug in whatever the, the sequencer's code. CentOS. CentOS. Yeah, yeah. all right. And then, <laughs> yes. I don't know that we need to, why would we need to change the FreeBSD behavior? FreeBSD uh, behavior no, not, not the behavior, but rather like to, to tell other than the message that this IP has been broadcasted via R. Oh. Uh, to show yeah. the conflict in a F config. Exactly. The thing is, is that's detected in the kernel, so I don't know who you're going to pass it to. Uh, I uh, yeah, I do not know, so I do have to think about that. But it does sound like a tiny feature that could be life saving for well, other people. Well, it should go. Syslog should pick it up via the kernel logger. It does. Yes, it does okay. indeed. So yeah, yeah. What, same what on Illumos, by the way. Like you can also see it in 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 their D message as well. But I just like the idea that we saw it in IP Adam. Uh, so that was nice. But uh, that's for our networking um, uh, problem today. And for the zones and stuff, so we've uh, obviously, well, how do we clone a FreeBSD jail? It's either a snapshot a clone, or it's an actual copy, or it's send receive. Um, and then you also, of course, copy the config file or if you don't have a config file you will just you know use another command line, other command line arguments on illumos however um there is the lowest abstraction which is zone config zone cfg and zone adam for zone administration and there is the higher uh, abstracted tools which is called z adam just z a d m uh, I, I, I'm not sure, but that might be Omni OS specific, but I'm not sure about that. I will ask. Um, we have been using Z Adam. It's, it works nice. We've, we've deployed our DHCP and DNS in there. Everything is great. And then our LDAP has been having issues because we don't like LDAP, but we have to use it because we don't like a Active Directory even more. But we've been having issues uh, uh, on, on LDAP, and we thought, hey, maybe we can, you know, clone the zone or like deploy LDAP zero as, as LDAP one and then play in LDAP one. So we don't break production. Um, here is where it got interesting. Uh, zones have what they call a state. It could be configured, it could be installed and it could be running. So if it's uh, not running, it's installed, right? And if you delete the files from inside of it, it's configured. And if you delete the config file, then it's not configured. It just doesn't exist anymore, obviously, which is a nice state machine for a zone. Obviously, the zone IDs do change, just like in FreeBSD. Uh, but, you know, the zone name is your identifier in that case. So uh, we, we thought about using any of the tools in zone config and zone Adam to just make a clone of it. And we haven't finished that yet today because both of our ISPs, who is the same, decided to have an outage because BGP is not easy for some reason, I guess. <laughs> uh, so hopefully by the next call, we'll have a very good idea on different mechanisms of deployment. However, with zone Adam and zone config, it's very easy to do snapshot clone. Very easy to do snapshot clone. But what I really want to do is send receive. 
instead of doing snapshot clone on the ZFS layer. Because uh, sometimes you want to have a completely separate uh, d d data set that has the exact same data. So uh, we also asked in the forums, we didn't get much of a reply, although most people use higher abstractions, like in SmartOS, there is VM Atom, et cetera. So uh, th that that might be a nice journey to, so to see how it's done. Uh, uh, Pre-ZFS era, there used to be an option called copy instead of clone or rather clone copy, uh, which would literally do CP of the data. So I don't know if I can, uh, if we need to document the send receive process or or what. So yeah, th th that that was an interesting journey today in, in zone land. I mean, after all, I think our uh, thumbnail on YouTube is, is jails and zones, right? Or am I wrong? I guess it, it is. Absolutely, absolutely is. We've had toaster sin, we've had Perhaps and do so. Yes, that's a a topic where we have hopefully a lot to learn yes. from each other. Yes, and the the the, the um, it, it is pretty nice interface. Uh, let's put it that way. Um, and and the zone the Z Adam high, highest abstraction is also a very cool utility to use. Uh, we haven't had any issues per se. Um, uh, I, I might even do uh, a comparison on the. Um, uh, routing stuff as well, routing and forwarding, because they also have a very interesting utility called Route Adam, which manages forwarding, routing. Um, uh, what what's that called? Um, uh, route D, the same Route D as FreeBSD, by the way, which is you know for uh, a rear version two. There's also you know all kind of routing that's involved in there, and as well as NDP. It's all done by a single command called route Adam. Uh, right. I like the, the the model that they have. There is like the lowest level of tools, like uh, if config, et cetera, et cetera. And there is a highest level of tools, which end in Adam, right? So like zone Adam and mm -hmm. uh, uh, route Adam and IP Adam, et cetera. So it's, it's a very cool way of doing that. So you can do very manual things and you can do very administrative oriented things, you know? So it's, it's very, very nice. Uh, but yeah, we've been pretty happy with it. We haven't cool. had any much issues and this was a nice journey and hopefully by next week we'll, we'll document our uh, ZFS plus uh, zones process as well. Uh, this is actually done on Jailer, by the way. In Jailer, you can do- On zones? Uh, uh, no, Jailer oh. on FreeBSD. Okay. Uh, you can do You can do dash- S and specify a snapshot for clone snapshot or dash S capital for send receive. Uh, we don't do non-ZFS, so we don't have copy per se. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I've thought about this when I was building Jailer and Jailer does have that. R rip, rest in pieces for minutes on each route change, lol. Uh, yeah, I know, right? But like it's... it's it's been working fine for most of, I mean, honestly, all of the deployments that I've done in my life. I've never had any issues with the oldest routing protocols ever. Uh, even in one of the universities, not the one that we're working at, but one of the major US funded universities in, in Armenia uh, does use the oldest routing protocols for like a very made, very big network. Of course, the limitation of 16 hops is awful. <laughs> Uh, but other than that, it, it works very, very well. Oh, and which reminds me, the US-funded university that uses old protocols is also um, FreeBSD-based. So like all of the routers there are FreeBSD as well. And each and each router has a mountain as its host name. So one of them is called Ararat, actually. Good. <laughs> so should, at some point, Zelta sprout little abilities to very carefully, safely copy a data set with some amount of just higher level syntax or is that completely orthogonal to its goals oh which does remind me i did test zelta on illumos omni os specifically and it did yes, the work fine so no no issues there it does throw some errors though so i yes talk to some illumos people because it's like the the uh, create txg um numbers don't don't align exactly but anyway that's that's secondary so what what would need to be what would need what addition would be need to, uh, would we need to add to make it uh, clone jails? I did notice in, in for for Beehive there's a there's actually uh, in VM Beehive there's a VM clone. But we can talk about hmm. we can talk about that Thursday. 
Um, but uh, yeah, there there is a there is a Zelta clone um, that'll that'll clone an entire uh, jail tree or any any tree, and um, and it'll reset the mount points appropriately. Uh, but uh, it sounds like it... there's a use case for an actual copy a duplication if you want to completely you know fork it and not have any of those dependencies on clones but just right though so, yeah the, i wonder uh, this is this is another zfs question but i wonder if there's any efficiency to be gained from a clone plus promote versus a copy i guess one one notable thing is that you could start using it instantly if you do a clone then promote um i don't know if it would be more efficient otherwise um, and then there, there's some things about ZFS forking that I'm learning how to do that none of the, or not many tools out there, um, do, but then again, that's another Wednesday conversation. Indeed. Uh, so there's nothing else there. Uh, Chris, do you have any jail and zone related news? Or we can just test your audio, which I needed some love. <laughs> Uh, actually, nothing on jails at the moment. No. Nope. Sounding good so far. That's cool. <laughs> Let's hope it stays that way. Um, on on the am I muted? I have no idea. Yeah, we hear oh, you. No, uh, on the on the collabora front, uh, that you've been bugging me, and thank you for doing that. Uh, things have been going okay. Um, that initially only two tests were being passed. Now there is around 10-ish. They have 52 tests. Uh, no, I am not acting as um, Volkswagen, where I'm changing the test instead of <laughs> changing yeah. the... Yeah. So, no. Uh, it, it's mostly GNUism. Uh, actually, it's all, all of it is GNUism. Let me put it that way. All of it is GNUism. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I've spent some time with my mentor. Uh, he, he has very good GNU make knowledge. I don't. I don't think anyone should, but there you go. That's life for you. Um, and and we've been um, we've been working on it, and hopefully, I, I hope this week if I have enough time. If not next week, I should be done with having complete Collabora ported to FreeBSD. Now the the idea was that I put it as a diff in ports with the patches that like we usually do for Chromium, but I think that's a bad idea. Instead, the Collabora folks have agreed to merge all of my changes if it's not breaking. And luckily nothing is breaking on their end. I am continuously testing on um, Ubuntu machine as well. Ubuntu? Yes, Ubuntu machine as well. Uh, so no, no issues there. Um, uh, what else? And their, their uh, CI that used to build FreeBSD is now not working. I don't know who's responsible for free BSD oh, on yeah, the CI. That. Yeah, I think yeah. It's, it was yeah. Circle or Circuit. I, hmm. I don't know. They all have very weird names. Um, so, so, so I'm, I, I think I'm going to need to help them to bring that CI alive. I remember that the foundation might have worked with one of the CI vendors to make free BSD available. Uh, but I, I, I have to maybe talk with the foundation about that as well. Did you catch um, DCH's comments on CI because he never wants to see Jenkins again? And that was on a recent I call. agree with him. Okay. I also hate Jenkins. Long live BuildBot. If anyone's looking for a good CI, BuildBot is the free BSD way to go. It's actually a meta CI. Uh, BuildBot is considered a meta CI where you can build your own CI, basically. It, it has a declarative language based on Python, and you just tell it what you want. We've been using it at our company to build FreeBSD uh, and then build our operating system on top of FreeBSD and then package our operating system on top of FreeBSD, and we have, haven't had any issues. Um, major deployments do use uh, BuildBot, and, and, it's, and it's imports. Just PKG install BuildBot, and you're done. So Dave gave his little monologue on the last call. So if you want to just scroll down like two inches. <laughs> I, I watched it. Yeah, I couldn't so, join because okay. I had no infection. Worries. But yeah. No worries. So no yes, worries. I'm, I'm, go I'm going all good with Collabora. I'll, I'll keep that up to date as much as I can. And they are also invested because they like the idea that someone can do PKG install Collabora and be done with it. Nice. Even the Linux systems don't have this. The Linux uh, yeah, system... no kidding. That was a huge surprise. <laughs> yeah, the Linux I've... system way is either Docker or you add their repositories. Yep. Do you see any challenges in jailing it? 
Uh, no, no, no I, I am doing it in a jail. D virtual FS is needed or anything? Okay. No, okay. no, no. I, uh, okay. Well, yes, there's a single binary that's in Java that does require proc FS to be mount. Proc okay. FS, CFS? I don't know which one. Whatever okay. the manual says, by the way. Uh, when you install Java, it does print a post installation message about that. So I just mm. followed that. But even if I don't do that, uh, it's, it also works fine because I've also run it in a temporary jail without those options. So it did work fine. My biggest challenge that I might need a lot of help is they have a process called cool jail or cool mount, both of them actually. Uh, cool jail and cool mount. What they do is they build a Linux root on Linux, obviously, um, because you know Linux doesn't have jails. So the idea is we rewrite cool jail again, called cool jail free BSD. But this time, cool jail free BSD, which you know, uh, uh, selectively no conditionally conditionally builds only on free bsd would use the jails framework uh instead of the the way that they're doing in their current one the cool jail has nothing to do with free bsd jail it's just a name that matches um so what they do is they actually copy the file system like they generate a tiny bit linux like 50 megabytes and they travel into it but maybe in on free bsd we can have a true uh, cool jail free bsd which would be much smaller the size of it i mean because we already have all the system calls that we need and it could even be a script in our case by the way i just realized like it just could be a script that executes the jail command um i i need to understand about the networking and stuff like that there i mean should it do like inherit networking and restrict on the file system and processes obviously doing it with vnet would be a very bad idea which means that if you do want to run collabora in a jail with cool jail free bsd version you will need to allow the jail to be able to create uh descendant jails so yes Ansonic may have some dtrace pointers and yeah dtrace has been a huge help in the collabora porting uh situation um, the reason why I, I, I am building in a jail because I can like run all the probes that I'm interested in and say match only for this jail and see what's happening in the system. So, so in that uh, context, Daniel and Jan were discussing something in chat, not to shift gears here. Uh, is there anything to report? Yeah, I don't want to hijack this. I can, I can pick this up next week. It's okay. an ongoing problem with Poudre jails that I've had for the last three years. Oh, I'm trying uh, to if it's a jail problem, can you describe it in just a moment? Because Antronik may have some detrace ideas. Yeah, just uh, I can do a thirty-second version. Sure, so please. when I when I run Pudre Pudre for you know for X amount of time, um, you know, of course it does it does ZFS unmounts and mounts, and it uses the ZFS jail function. Um, to to do all that and and what's happening is the mounts get i for lack of a better word stuck and i've tried i've tried a million different things to make this not happen but the only way i can get the the uh the the file system unmounted is to reboot um so fstat you know jail off turn off the jail flag turn off the the, the jail property the jailed property it doesn't matter i get i get these things stuck so my feeling is that and by the way this happened on three different servers or four different servers for me so i sort of think that cfs jail might be mostly but not completely baked if i may. like their <laughs> nfs support you mean have, have <laughs> you been, tried yeah to use, yeah have you tried to use lsof to find out if somebody has a open file in said file system because you can't unmount yes them. yes yeah i i've definitely i've definitely double checked all of all of that um yeah i've tried yeah i've, I've tried i've tried having the mount points under the jail i've had tried having the mount points on a completely different z pool and it which, just which mount points are these? These are the Pudre mount points. So basically, so um, Pudre slash data slash etc. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, by default, the mount output even on the host won't show certain types of mount points, for example, ZFS snapshots being mounted. So yeah, if the problem is a file on hmm? sub mounts. Yes, and right. you can see those with mount dash v over both. Yeah, so any anything I do, I mean, I, I've hit every everything with just XRs, removing every imaginable property, checking for any imaginable process running, and all I can say is it's stuck deeper than than user land can get to it. But I, I you know, I I don't, I, unfortunately, I don't have enough time. But I could I could draw up some examples of what I what I got myself into and what I've tried to fix it but but dan um you haven't seen this because you use pudra in a jail right yes and i have had times when i haven't been able to get something to unmount but it's not a recurring thing if you want send me an email and i'll email you my jail configuration and how the the file systems are laid out and okay. you can send me the same. Well, once I send you what I send you, you show me what you're using. And maybe it's something subtle. Right. I'll take. I'll definitely take you up on that. Thanks. It's, it's definitely worth spending the effort to see if somebody else can replicate your problem. Because yeah, replication I mean, is the first step in, in diagnosis. Yeah, Brad Davis set me up in the first place, and it happened on one box, and then I set it up myself on two or three other boxes. And <laughs> I mean, it just it like happens every like four months or something. It drives me nuts. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll definitely pass that around and see if uh, somebody can find it. Sadly, I have to go talk to a client. My least favorite part of the day. Um, yeah. Over that four month time period. Has the box been rebooted at any time? No, no, yeah. no. So, so it fits. So the reason why it's lasted this long is because I fixed it by just you know running my FreeBSD patches, and then I'm good to go for another X amount of time until it happens. But yeah, I haven't had monitoring on it. So a few times I got into a situation where I wasn't getting my my package updates. Um, but that's that's my bad. I should have been. Should have been more careful. Okay, I'll wait for your email. All right, much appreciated, Dan. Um, uh, talk to everybody out. later. Thanks so much. I'm seeing a few results on like Podri or error handler or tries to destroy the wrong Z pool, but that's probably not it. But anyway, good. Thank you, Dan, for offering help to Dan. Let's see. Um, Anything else, or is that a great healthy spread of wisdom? Oh. Yes. Oh, yeah. And you had an update. Uh, yeah, let her rip. What you got? So, um, right now, jail.conf can do a few things libucl can't. And I looked into what could be done with libucl's uh, extension mechanisms uh, in the form of macros to. Uh, do what jail.conf can already do for us so that we could have the other nice things from libucl. And you can build a, a, a include directory macro doing what I want so that it registers uh, the relevant things as variables and uh, scans a directory for each uh, file in the directory ending in .ucl or .conf, it will basically create an object and then uh, include the content of the file into the object so that the configuration file's content does not contain the object and thereby does not contain the object name. And if the file in the directory is named uh, with a suffix ending in .inc, it instead gets included directly into the current object without a wrapper around it so that you can really mix and match. Uh, right now I have just one little annoyance that it uh, libucl tries to be a bit too clever and resolves the 
in the case of symlinks, the symlink using real path itself, and then, yeah, so I have to tell it the prefix ex uh, manually and to prevent it from deriving the outer name from the name of the file symlink2 instead of the name of the symlink, but that's just a minor nonce. Then I also wrote a little macro allowing uh, the configuration to set uh, libucl variables so that you can just define variables from the configuration directly. Um, in theory, libucl has a callback you can register to um, handle missing variable references. So if uh, you reference a variable and the variable is not registered with libucl, your callback gets invoked and it should be able to uh, do the variable uh, replacement then by telling libucl what this variable should have resolved to so that, and you get enough context that you can uh, look at what has already been passed. So I wanted to make use this to make basically everything you've already assigned available as a variable. Um, but that part right now, I think there's a bug in libucl if you try to use it like that, because uh, my um, replacements aren't applied. Instead, I only get uh, a replacement with an empty string. I have to debug that. So yeah, with some, but with just the two already working macros, um, you can do basically what the type of configuration you do with jail.conf right now, where you reference the jail name inside the jail configuration. And yeah. So my motivation to look into this again uh, was uh, looking at what VMstd does and doesn't do with libucl because it should be possible to have a single global configuration mm, instead of having to basically hard code in the application where the configuration is, and then having the option of reusing parts of the configuration from a collection of little snippets to be symlinked into directories and so on. Yep. So it's possible, it's like a bit of annoying C code, but less than 100 lines probably. Did UCL uh, have a macro facility or you're adding, inventing that? Uh, it has an uh, existing concept of macros and you can register your own. If I you see. instantiate the parser, then it will have a hand handful of default macros, like the normal include macro uh, is one of them. Then there's one to load a file into a variable so that you can have binary data uh, slurped into uh, the configuration. For example, certificates uh, or passwords or stuff like this, but you don't want to have in your normal configuration. Um, and yeah, or scripts, you don't want to quote and double and triple quote, which is the bane of jail.conf. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and the other thing which would be a lot more useful if it was a little bit more flexible is the option to inherit from an existing object, but you can only inherit from top level configuration objects, which is messy. Uh, but yeah, it wouldn't be hard to uh, replace it with a better um, macro, which can really call the recursive lookup function on the key instead of just the non-recursive one on the root of the uh, already passed configuration. Chris, has UCL treated you well for VM state D? Definitely, yeah. Okay. Um, then again, I've not been doing a whole lot of complex stuff. And as Jan also recently pointed out, um, it is definitely way more capable than what I'm using. I'm probably using like 20% of what you can do now. Hmm. Good to hear. Well, thank you for that update. Uh, and I, go ahead. I used it, uh, the example configuration uh, for uh, the MCD as a starting point. 
And if I find out, let's see, let's see, MD at. And while you look that up, I'm curious if anyone's had issues jailing Samba. I've spent a great many hours this last mm. day or two on Samba, and we'll be doing so today with a new clean environment lab. So, uh, I've done it in the past, uh, at least with uh, 4.13 and 4.16. Yep. It works, but you have uh, to specify the listen address explicitly. Interesting. And I only run SMBD, not the uh, other stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, when the jailed? Is that, uh, with alias uh, addressing, you can't do the multicast group membership stuff. And uh, So, yeah, but who really needs uh, net bias name resolution, right? Okay. Okay, so, well... Mm. So, for example, I now have a VM state deconf which specifies this. Dan, did you have something? Which then expands it to something like this. No, it was, it was actually me. Oh, Rodney, I, sorry, I couldn't. Yeah, both. Has quiet. anybody used Samba the other way? I want. I have a file shared out from a Windows platform. I want to mount them on FreeBSD. Uh, um, you don't need Samba. You can do that with the in-base tool. Um, oh, no, you can't. Well, I've been, I've done it. No, <laughs> it's SMB on that yes, system. but yeah. only with SMB1. Yeah. Um, uh, I exactly, hit a 2016 yeah. server. I'll show you. I'll drop in my syntax. Yeah, I think the 2016 server still supports exporting SMB1, but that that's fine. Well, let me, I'll drop and some syntax in in just a second. Use the mount more. SMB command. Mm. Um, that thing doesn't work for anything. Uh, I, I rescued some data with it, so what do you mean? <laughs> I've tried to get it to mount with the mount SMB command, and I, and I just have not had success. I will so I can, drop in my syntax. I can think what, what do you guys? I can. You, I can actually. Huh? Do you guys? You yeah, everybody use this fuse? Or I hate that one too, but it works. Yeah, that's the easier uh, solution. Use what, the use fuse SMB? Uh, SMB client. Yes. Okay. It supports SMB two and three. My experience has been with use of fuse. Is fuse is horrifically slow. Not wrong. It is. <laughs> Oh, well, depends. Yeah. For bulk reads and writes, it can be okay, but you have a noticeable overhead uh, just by design for metadata operations. Brian, but try and you... write a 16 gigabyte memory stick with Fuse MTFS and enjoy your weight. Yeah, well, you're not wrong. It shouldn't be too bad. I've used it to saturate a gigabyte minutes? thing. No, then you have a terrible USB stick. Fuse alone is not for explanation. A very bad fuse server would be it's, an explanation. It's not the USB stick performance because the USB stick for write performance is in excess of 100 megabytes a second. So Rod, I then dropped my syntax used in production there on in the chat and it worked. It worked. It what it, the, My only complaint was that it dumped uh, permissions, I believe. Timestamps were preserved, but everything became the user mounting it just saying okay well thank you anything else welcome back daniel bell of course now my client who i thought ghosted bell? me is saying oh. i have to get on the call so cool. well that is reason enough to call this at 11 let's see what are we at 11 11 pacific and i'm happy to be around a few minutes and i wish you all a great week perhaps seeing some of you tomorrow chris so like do you want chris? the honors uh, like and subscribe excellent <laughs> have a great one everyone